Welcome to episode 196 of the CU Insight Experience. I'm Randy Smith, one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and this show is all about taking a deep dive with the leaders of the credit union movement that make it so great. This episode is brought to you by Valera, formerly PSCU Co-op Solutions, the nation's premier payments credit union service organization and an integrated financial technology solutions provider. Valera serves more than 4,000 financial institutions throughout North America, operating with velocity to help its clients keep pace with the rapid momentum of change and fuel growth in a new era of financial services. They also have a longtime partner and supporter of this show, so we thank them. Check them out in the show notes. Today, I'm having a conversation with Samantha Beeler. Samantha is the president of the League of Southeastern Credit Unions and Affiliates, and I, I can tell you I'm excited for this conversation. So with that, let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Samantha. Well, thank you for having me. 196 is my lucky number, so glad this oh, worked out. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> let's start with a little bit of background for the folks out there who don't know you. Where did your career start and you know, how did it lead you to the president role of LSCU? Yeah, it actually started, you know, we were chatting about Africa a little bit as we were hopping on here. It started when I was a missionary. So I was a missionary before I ever joined credit union space, met some credit unions along that journey, didn't have context for them at the time, but went through 30 different countries, led some teams and ultimately ended up back in the States. And when I ended up Mm -hmm. back in this, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, and it's funny now, I, I, every now and then I run across someone in credit union space and we share a love of Malawi or we share a love of Thailand. And that's what I so wonderful about our movement is people, it's truly global and people do invest and learn from all corners of the world. So I've, that, that drew me into the credit union space as I got to know it. But after being a missionary, I went up to DC and worked okay. at a law firm there, full disclosure, not a lawyer, but did government contracts and client acquisition. And I missed that heart side of the work. I missed the people and the really feeling like I was making a difference. My sister sent me a job description for credit union, uh, credit union lobbying role. And the rest is history. Uh, 12 years later, could never fathom not being part of the credit union movement. Uh, that is amazing. And, I, and I'll po- apologize to the listeners if, if I break up in this at all. I was. Samantha was saying, I'm actually in Africa at Saka Congress as we're recording this. So, um, And like you mentioned around credit unions, this year, because of a push that AACUC and Mike Mercer did and Renee over there, there's, I think it's 32 U.S. credit union representatives here on the continent. So it's it's pretty amazing. And, and for many, it's their their first time over here. So it's fun to, to see them all light up and get that feeling, right? So anyways, uh, enough about that. Let, let's jump right into credit unions. What are the, the, the biggest challenges that your league is is over multiple states. So you're, and then obviously everything that you do on the national level, what are you seeing as the biggest t- challenges that we're facing today in your opinion? So I'm going to mention one that doesn't feel quite so universal, but it's very timely okay. for us. We're facing down our second hurricane in two weeks That's- time with you know a magnitude that all the, you know, all the scientists talking heads and, and powers that be are telling us that this is one of the strongest that'll ever hit this region, also to have two of this gravity back to back. And Absolutely. and just navigating that, I think credit unions in general have built in resiliency. But I think of our friends in the Carolinas who yep. you half, know, are half of our team works and it lives in Greenville. Oh, you know, are they know. okay? They've all been fine, but many didn't have power up until about a day ago still. As far as I, I know, two of the three all have their power back. I'm not sure if the third one does, but yeah, I mean, we're so close to Asheville and, and that area. And it's just, yeah, like you're saying, you're in our thoughts down there in Florida. That's for sure. Yeah, well, I, we appreciate that. And we'll, we'll take them all. And the thing about it is it's not just the hurricanes, right? We saw tornadoes rip through our footprint earlier this year, but Alabama had it one in a century ice storm that we kicked off the year with. And so I just think of the natural disasters and also the, uh, you know, cybersecurity risks I would put high up there as the second. And then the third is regulatory threats. And when you look at that landscape, it doesn't feel particularly, you know, empowering. It actually feels really demotivating (laughs) for credit unions. So if you wrap that all up with a bow, I think the biggest thing credit unions need is kind of grit for the next season and the challenge of change. We have a whole conference around taking on the future. And this year, our keynote to round us out about the future. It wasn't an AI speaker. It wasn't a crypto speaker. It wasn't cybersecurity risk. It was an individual 
who was a firefighter. And uh, he was a California wildfire fighter. Oh, and okay. he reminded us that the number one challenge we all face is not having the courage for the future. And I think that's what credit unions need. We need a lot of courage to take on, you know, really building a future for ourselves. And credit unions can sometimes, I don't think they lack courage, but it can be very demotivating when your environment is so threatening to really have the courage to have more risk and to do new things and to pioneer ways that might not feel like how we started, but it's where we need to go for our members. Okay. I am circling back on that for sure. But I know if I said it right now, I'd kind of jump into to, to multiple questions that I, I want to ask you uh, down the road here. So uh, as much as I'm like, oh, gosh, there's so pl- many places I want to go there. I- I'm going to just move ahead with the other one. So a twofold question here. What has you most excited that you and your team are working on? And when you look at the movement, so now we we, we know what the, the challenges are. Where should we, I guess, be using that? Grit? What has you excited that you're seeing uh, you know, in our movement nationally? Yeah, well, the first thing, it's just a little thing that we're working on called a, a merger with the Virginia <laughs> Credit Unions. We're thrilled. I'm actually <laughs> up here in Virginia right now, headed... Uh, We've been crisscrossing the whole four state footprint over the last few weeks and just getting to know the Virginia Credit Unions and the amazing team at the Virginia Credit Union League. We've already partnered with many of them over the last few years because that's what the credit union space and especially leagues do so well. So it was relationships we had, but this is a whole new dimension to it. So I'm just thrilled. It's it's a great fit. And the credit unions here are just as phenomenal as the credit unions in our current three states. And it's fun to see them. Actually, there are so many people that have, you know, this, gosh, you probably... Many of your interviews have probably highlighted this. I can't tell you how many people in Virginia used to work in Florida. Oh, and then they worked for this person who's now in Georgia and they spend time in Alabama. And and the credit union system, it's so wonderful to see it, you know, it gets small quickly. And so there's a lot oh, yeah. of cross-pollinization already. So that's obviously kind of job one is, is bringing these two groups together through the end of the year. How about nationally? What has you excited that that you're seeing out there? Yeah, I'm actually really uh, proud of the work that the entire movement has put into this election cycle. It can be easy to just think of it as a presidential cycle. I've seen a huge uptick in the collaboration of getting true credit union champions to Congress. And that's something that takes all of us. You know, we don't have a speaker of the House in our footprint, but we do have a number of key, you know, committee leaders and they need help and the caucuses need help and, and really showing up for people who showed up for us in this congressional cycle. That work. I think credit unions do it better than anybody else in the space. So nationally, I think we've done a really good job influencing the elections for good outcomes for the industry. And of course, ACU sure. bringing itself together. thats a That was a big task. And we all had to be a part of making sure that we support that and, and buy into it and believe in the vision that they're painting. Because I think one voice is going to make us a lot louder when it comes to the next decade of credit union advocacy. That's true. I'd like to talk a little bit about mentors as you made your way to the president chair. Are there people that I guess have helped you in your career to getting where you are? You mentioned like, you know, coming into credit unions and not necessarily knowing what they were. Um, <laughs> you just met some cool people in them. You know, so have there been, have you had those mentor type relationships or coaches uh, along the way to get you to where you are today? Yeah, we could spend the rest of the podcast listing them off. You're with a few of them right now. You happen to know one of them very well. I'd I'd be honored to count Jill as a mentor. She's someone who I'll never forget my first GAC meeting her. She this very on brand pulled me into a taxi and was like, I don't know you, but I think I should. And then proceeded to tell me all I needed to know about Oregon Credit Unions. And we never actually, I left that night not knowing her name. I was like, who is that? And they're like, oh, that's Jill. Everybody that? knows Jill. Yeah. That is the least surprising thing I've ever heard from somebody. Yeah. Just like, no, it's, hey, who are you? My name's Jill. Tell me about you. <laughs> so. Very on brand. But golly, yeah. and I think of Jennifer Wagner. She's the chief advocacy officer for Go West and Troy Stang. I mean, those two uh, but they believed in me. They pushed me. They also taught me so much. Troy's the kind of leader who he'll give you the whole backstory and the history. I feel like I've been around credit unions decades longer than I actually have. And it's because he would always tell you, you know, well, let's start back in the 70s. And every now and again, you can imagine you're sitting yeah. there like, oh, gosh, I just asked, you know, a simple <laughs> question. But you, you, I, I was wasn't like, real. Was that? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and at the time, too, it's like being a parent with a kid. You don't always realize the mentors are mentoring you. I think of Debbie Kesey. I think of Renee Saddy White. I think of, oh, my gosh, uh, now I'm going to get in trouble because I started naming people. But Patty and Caroline and people who just chose to say, hey, I see you and I'm going to reach out and, and ensure you've got what you need. And also... I guess one of the 
things as a league president, it's a small group. There's not a lot of us. And so making sure that we have each other, have moments to support each other and say, oh, I navigated that recently. Here's what I did. There's a very open book. It's different than credit unions because we really can be like, here's my whole balance sheet. Here's every relationship I have. Here's what we send to the credit unions. And they'll give you the same on their end. So that's how, honestly, if it wasn't for the open sharing of communication and demystifying the context in credit union land, it would have taken me a lot longer to get to this place. I'm only here because very, very good people have said, yeah, you can do it. Even when I didn't think I could. Let me ask you this, because this is one that, and I've I've mentioned this so many times on the podcast, because I can really think of somebody in my life, at least when I was starting CU Insight and stuff like that, that would, if you want to kind of say, is there one of those people that you mentioned or somebody in your world who you throw something out there and they're, you know, they're not going to like sugarcoat it. If they're like, Samantha, what are you thinking? You got what, what, you know, like that person who kind of, I don't want to say speaks truth to power, but uh, you know, I, for me, it was a former league president because he used to work at Union Times before that. But Paul <laughs> Gentile, I, I always knew I could call him and I would throw something out there at him and he was not going to mince words with me. You know what I mean? Like where a lot of other people might, if they're busy, they might be like, Oh yeah, you'll do great. And that's it. Doesn't mean they're not being supportive, but do you have anybody like that? They're not going to sugarcoat it with you. They're going to, they'll call you out if they think you're doing something that's not right. Yeah. It's how many. (laughs) Yeah. I'm really proud of my team. Maureen comes to mind, but I have an entire leadership team that leads that way. They know that Uh, I don't think that it's my voice in the room that should be the voice. And, and they are all very strong leaders and have skills. I don't have, have experience. I don't have. And so when we bring things up, it's definitely by committee. They, also remind me, and I, I, I bring it up because it's trivial in some contexts, but I truly mean this. I'll always spotlight Maureen because, you know, I'm sure you've done them in your a 360 and you always yep. get you know, 360 reviews and go, oh, you're great. They have less meetings. And you're like, cool. Thank you uh, for this very, <laughs> con- you know, that was very gritty feedback. You know, she never bats an eye at saying, oh, your communication is not thorough enough. You are you communicate conceptually, you need to make sure that you're speaking to the people who need more details. And then you need to back off faster to let them create details. And then you need to come back and you're not coming back fast or you're coming back too fast. You're coming back in the span of 30 days, not too much. I mean, that's the level of feedback that my leadership team owns. And I couldn't operate without it. So how do you create that type of environment though, right? The most popular thing that I think a CEO has said on this podcast at 196 episodes in is like, I have an open door policy. Like I want the feedback, but to truly get that, right? We've all worked for people who probably would have said that on this podcast, but you're like, no, no, you don't. (laughs) Like, that's not true. (laughs) You know, how do you create that environment where it is, the the word that's coming to mind is safe, where everybody feels safe Mm -hmm. that they don't have to agree 100% of the time and they know that they're... In the end, you still have to make the final decision. The Mm -hmm. the buck does stop someplace. So like, how do you create that environment where your executive team is comfortable giving you feedback that might be different than like what you thought going in? And then also being able to, when you do make that final decision, even if it's not exactly what they wanted, and I'm doing air quotes that nobody can see, but (laughs) that you, that then they get on board and you're able to bring them along and know that, you know, trust that you're doing what's best for the, you know, the organization overall. Going from my president on the for-profit, which makes us unique. I think there's only a handful of leagues in the nation with that. And we will openly disagree with each other without contempt. And people know that we are not the same personality. And so they can see multiple paths to success in the organization. And because they know that we'll disagree, they know, I I hope that they then think, okay, well, I can also say this thing because that's only two perspectives. And maybe they need my third perspective. But it started a lot further back than that. And I think it came from you kind of mentioned open door. I think that's the wrong way. Like if you sit at your desk and have an open door and expect that people feel empowered to walk over the threshold and then just opposite side when you're in the chair of power, I think you got to flip that script. You've got to go into their office. You got to show you care. You've got to listen. You got to let them be right. You've got to be willing to be wrong. And just really showing those moments of consideration and release. It's funny. You said the buck stops with me. I actually, I remind them often the buck stops with them because I'm not going to come back on the tail end of their work and be like, well, why weren't you doing this? I, I want to join them at the start and, and dream with them and then let them run. As I mentioned, I've got some lobbyists on my team that could run circles around my lobbying strategy. Why? Because okay. yep. they've lobbied in a state I've never lobbied in. And so they know that governor right. better. And so trusting that they're the experts, I think that helps. And also, look, we've had our own a- adventures. And I just think a team that has gone through tough times or hard times, there's it'll never replicate 
coming out the other side of those rapids and being like, we did that together. We did that because we trusted each other. Yeah, that's pretty cool. One of the things I love about hosting the podcast is I get to just ask some of these like scratch my own itch questions. And a couple of years ago, I heard this question on another another podcast, but it was uh, that idea of like, what's the greatest investment you've made in your career? And the example they gave was Warren Buffett said Dale Carnegie courses. Is, Is there something looking back that you're like, I wouldn't be who I am, where I am today if I didn't do X? Oh, absolutely. There's two things. And when I read this question in the, you know, prep message, I was very excited because they're two of the most opposite professional development choices I've ever made, but both of them were necessary. So one of them, kind of more run of the mill, I opted out of professional development. In our role, we got to go to a lot of conferences naturally. So I got to pick up on a lot of brain food, but I always pushed, I wanted to go outside the credit union bubble for executive development. Uh And I said, hey, if I save some money year after year, can I go to kind of like a big one? And of course, like I mentioned, great, great leaders and mentors at Go West. They said, absolutely, save up some dollars. And and the other piece was actually get in. I'm not sure they thought necessarily that that would happen. But the Harvard Kennedy School has an executive leadership program, and it was on moral and ethical leaders. Um, And they were retraining folks from countries who have had you know, genocide. They were working with the oh, EPA, geez. bringing in top leaders to reform our nuclear waste program. And so I knew if I just sat next to some of those people, I was going to learn things that I couldn't fathom in our, my current role in that program. You know, a few weeks of time together on campus up there and learning from those professors, I still use to this day many of those models when I'm going into a tough strategic planning with a credit union or somebody who's navigating big change in an organization, I fall back on a lot of those models. And that was very, you know, it was very heady and and tough and I loved it. And then the other piece, I love public speaking. It's a big part of my role. I felt like I was, you know, not the best public speaker and I wanted to get better and I could go get a coach, right? Or just emulate what I'm seeing from Simon Sinek and others. And instead I got some advice from uh, actually Denise Gable, who Worked okay. at yeah. the Northwest and Filene and she's so, you know, she's so great, so energetic. And she was like, go do stand-up comedy, go do improv. Oh my God. And I was like, yeah, I was like, no, never. And she's like, I did improv. It's made me better. And sure enough, she was a great presenter. So uh, during the pandemic, <laughs> I signed up and I did stand-up comedy. I did a few routines, had to do open mic nights, had to perform a whole set. It was grueling. I've never been more nervous for anything. Professionally speaking, that was definitely I, I would say that's one of the things in my career that I'm most proud that I actually got up on that stage. Now, okay. full disclosure, I did fail because I asked to go into the 201 course and he was like, maybe another round through the 101. So <laughs> Amazing. Wasn't a good hey, I, I respect that. I do not enjoy public speaking at all. It's the reason I love this podcast. Like, so it's, I'd much rather communicate this way. So you getting up and doing that, I'm like, Wow, that just blows my mind. Talk about that's like jumping out of a plane for me or something, but that's that's amazing. So that might be my favorite answer ever to this question. Um, <laughs> oh, good. Well, yeah, expect no jokes. I, I have no jokes, but uh, I, I was but, thinking about putting on the spot, but I'm like, yeah, I don't please think that's, don't. That's, that's probably not necessary. But next time we see each other, like at GAC, I'll expect a joke. So, or a little oh, bit. Oh, for sure. So. <laughs> I'll prepare. It will take me that entire time to do so. <laughs> I want to go back to the leadership team. When you're looking at like building your leadership team or as you're, you know, I mean, there's, there's normal attrition that happens and things like that. If it's adding to your team, is there like something that you look for? So much of what you said just totally resonates with me about the idea of like, you want people that, you know, are smarter than you in that area that they're, they're responsible for. So like, what are you looking for when you're adding to your leadership team? And on the flip side of that, if, is there something in an interview that's just a no go? Can I do the interview one first? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So secondhand experience here. I was not in the interview myself. My team was in the interview and we did have a parent join the interview. That was like... that uh, was a joke. That really no, happens? It genuinely happened. And it, here's the kicker. It wasn't an entry-level position. And this person did have workforce experience. And so my HR guy, he, he called me. He's like, you're not going to believe it. Because you read the articles and you hear about it. But no, you know, I've, you know it's like... I've saw even like goofy reels else. on Instagram where they were talking about that. I mean, it was... Uh, yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's unbelievable. Wow, that really no, happened. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, their parent was worried because they were the job was like out of state. And so they wanted to get more information. And, uh, you and know, they came it, into the interview. Yeah. Join the Zoom link. So, oh my goodness. Uh, 
Yeah. So that was an absolute no. And then yeah. I will say the other, just tying on to that, when I hear a ton of, I, 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 I yeah. done this, yeah. I built that. I, we all know you didn't. So talk about how you galvanized the team to do so, how you created a following, how you in, mm-hmm. influenced your leadership. If people show me that, that they're aware that it wasn't them, that yeah. emotional intelligence will win me over a lot faster than a lot of accomplishments. Absolutely. What are you looking for when you're looking yeah, for your, so the, your team? The biggest thing I'm looking for, and it's probably pretty universal, are self-starters. You know, people who are in, yeah. in, they're motivated internally. They have a reason for doing what they do and you don't have to give them that reason. Those people, yep. I much rather remind people that they have to come back to earth every now and again, than <laughs> try to convince people they need to try and experiment and shoot for the stars, right? Like if you're constantly trying to pull a team, I think, you're already behind. If I'm reminding my team to like, Hey, take it, take a deep breath, take a moment. Then I get to be a coach instead of a micromanager. So I, I look for that. And you know, what's funny, you know, where you can hear it the most. Yeah, it's please when, tell me. <laughs> so in the answer, you know, everyone, everyone likes to be like, what's your greatest strength. I always ask really off the wall questions. My team knows this. In fact, they know I'm liking a candidate when I break into the round of questioning because we do these panel interviews and I'll ask them what their favorite color is, why it's their favorite color. If you could rename a month, any month on the calendar, what would you rename? And people who have ideas and are self-starters, even if they're totally taken aback by the question, they're going to come up with something and be creative. And then if they're not and it trips them up, and they're nervous, how they handle the nerves. If they look to connect with someone, if they're like, oh, I'd like some time. Can I get back to you? If they have a strategy for handling pressure, they're going to be a self-starter, mm-hmm. even if their personality type is different. I like that. Well, we're in the interview process right now. So maybe I'll start <laughs> throwing those in there. <laughs> well, there you <laughs> that's go. Really, that's really cool. Yeah. You know, you talking about that idea of like self-starters. I To me, that's, you know, everybody puts their best foot forward in an interview, you hope. But to know like, that motivation level and like how people execute and how they like can strategically think. I, it's one of those things. Obviously, in my house, we depend on Joe <laughs> a lot for that. So, <laughs> but because I've I had struggled with that in the past for sure. So, um, but you know, now that you have a team, how do you give feedback? You've mentioned that you know you don't want to micromanage, right? So, how do you give feedback? And if somebody does. I mean, we've all been disappointed at times, right? Like, but if somebody uh-huh. does, uh, if there is a failure, you know, how do you give feedback to, I guess, keep people moving people forward? Because we, we all know, even all the best ideas are not all going to work, right? So. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. I think a big thing that we've done is we've given ourselves common language. So we tried to make it fun and relatable. So we actually created this document together as a team that outlined, instead of saying, we wanted to be a, you know, fast to fail, quick to learn yeah. culture that takes the toleration of failure. And so we wanted language that was where it didn't feel like I failed. I have to send an email that says I failed and everybody has to be like, oh, here's, you know, here's your F and how do we learn? So we made it, we have three levels of failure. The first is a kerfuffle. That's a, that's a fun one. That's a, I sent the wrong date. Oh, my apologies. There's no Zoom link. I forgot to loop you in on that. Uh, And then we, borrowed a, a page from the military playbook and we have a snafu and we call them a small snafu. A snafu is when you need to bring in a few other people, let them know where you messed up. Maybe we got to go back to a credit union, tell them different information. A snafu needs support. And that's the differentiating factor. A kerfuffle, you can clean up yourself. A snafu needs support. And then we have oh the boy. big snafu. And if, big you have, snafu. If, you, yeah, if you have to have a big snafu, we, that means I need a Zoom meeting. I need a call right now. And it gave the team, and we we said, you know, attach memes when necessary. And so that's also been <laughs> kind of like the team now has a few memes. We'll circulate and uh, uh, or yeah. we'll text each other. And you kind of know, okay, I know what call I'm about to get from this team member. We've got something to navigate. And what it did was kind of take this thing out. And I also like to, as much as possible, sometimes maybe too much, but I do go, I, I share with my team when I've made snafus. I'll bring up my kerfuffles. I'll... I'll share them in an all staff so that they know yeah. I'm holding myself accountable too. 
the same way. Yep. That's, that's powerful. This is a question I've really enjoyed asking this, I'd say in the past year. And, and it's this idea. And I was thinking about it, like how, like many of us grew up reading the same leadership books and things like that over time, right? Like the same ones that have been referred for decades. Some have held up, most haven't. <laughs> you know, it's like, what does make a, a great CEO in, in your opinion today? You know, boy, even the, the, the leadership course you talked about going through at Harvard and things like that, you, you know, where there's that change that has happened. What do you think makes a great CEO today or a great leader in general? Yeah, well, I'll just steal from other people's intellectual property, which I think does make a good CEO and say that, uh, you know, Harvard Business came out a few years back and they said the number one thing boards are looking for when hiring a new chief executive officer is now emotional intelligence because motivating the people used to be subject matter expertise or a discipline on the financials or knowing some, the widget. I think knowing the humans motivating the humans is something that the AI can't do yet and won't for a while still. So I do think yep. that's important. You mentioned books, though. And I think one of the most formative books, and this was long before I ever thought of being, you know, that this is the path I would be on as a true political science nerd. I read the book Team of Rivals, which is about how Lincoln built coalition mm-hmm. with many of his rivals, right? And I do not like the concept of an enemy. There is, even in this political environment today, we have right. so much more in common then we have that yeah. separates us. And you, you, you might as well have been here last night. We were all sitting around last night talking about that. But if you if you just take uh, the title off, right, there still is a common, like we do have a lot in common, folks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could have been there. Well, one, because uh, the brain trust that I could have learned from in that setting. <laughs> Uh, but also, my favorite thing is actually this time of year uh, around a presidential bill index products. And they'll be like, this is the Democrat product. This is the Republican product. You know, it's the... It's yep. the Walmart versus Whole Foods, right? The, you know, the number one divisive product this year on the scale was cereal. Really? Here's how, yeah, yeah. That's and here's how polarized ridiculous. we were. Frosted flakes versus frosted mini wheats. And to me, it's such an allegory. You're talking about sugar-coated carbs. How American what? that somehow you're sugar-coated that, carbs. So if, if you're a conservative or liberal, you like one better or one's for, like, that's so, that blows my mind. I guess I haven't yeah. been paying enough attention. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I don't even want to know. One more than the other. Because <laughs> right? it's so ridiculous, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it, the scale, like when people weighted it, it was the most, it was the products that were farthest apart on the spectrum. And you just have to say, gosh, if we could all just wake up and re- remember that we truly in this country love the vast majority of the same things, believe in the same things and believe in the ability for us to have differing opinions as that was one of the most important parts of our foundation. We've got to build back the muscle that allows us to, uh, you know, disagree to agree and, and build consensus instead of building up the two far sides of our parties. I need to cut carbs also. So that's, I should just <laughs> yeah. stay away from both of those. But anyways, <laughs> let me ask you this. And you talked about it earlier a bit, and this is where I can some of these questions right now are where I had to hold myself back because I, I really wanted to dig into this. But you're talking about the challenge of, I, I mean, some some of the stuff that you started with, I was just thinking the speed of change. It, it, it's always been there, right? But like, there, there's just a lot that's going on and that's not going to stop. How do you, and, and I like asking this question in the sense that no matter how big our organization is in credit unions, none of us have unlimited resources. We just don't. It's uh, right. and, and most of us tend to have limited resources when it comes to that. So how do you continue continue to to take risks, to move fast, to to know when to pivot. Like every time I ask this question, there's these things in my head that I kept doing way too long and just kept throwing good money and good resources after bad when, you know, I knew six months in I should have just no, that's need to pivot. Let's use that, those resources anyplace else. How do you make sure that you're not doing that, right? Like how do you know make sure that you you can pivot away from an idea or something that is taking resources to reallocate them in a place where there's more chance for success? It's a phenomenal question. I, it takes a little bit of self-reflection because I think my personality type or just my approach is that I, I actually probably change too quickly sometimes or I don't oh, allow <laughs> time for things to marinate. I'm like, oh, it didn't gel, let's roll. Uh, and my team can be like, wait a minute, we didn't even have the time to really dig into that. Let's give it a beat and see. And yet I will tell you one of the ways that I know it's time to move on from a league standpoint is when our members start talking about it. Because by that point, we should we should have put something in front of them that was different long ago. 
because they are gracious with us and they are, you know, they, they know that they make these leagues successful. So what I would say in the credit union context is if you're already getting feedback on that product, the pivot should have been six months before you started hearing you needed that thing. And so I like to think that I, my job is to be out front of the industry at all times and kind of bringing stuff in. And yet the legacy piece, like what do we hold on to that is the cornerstone, that is pivotal, that is job one? And what do we let go because it served us then, but it's not serving us now? And I might be too fast to let things go, actually. Okay, rabbit hole question. Because you talked about like when you start hearing from members, it's too like you should have made that adjustment beforehand. And it, for some reason in my head, it sparked me back to many, many episodes, first season, like I think it was episode four or five when Chuck Fagan from PSU at the time, but, but now Valera was on the show and he was talking about board relationships and hearing from them. They're your boss, that type of thing. But he's like, you have to be able to get through the squeaky wheel. And I'm not asking you to put anybody on the spot here, right? Like, or any of your credit unions. I'd never ask that. But like, how do you know the difference between a squeaky wheel who just, we all know the people that just don't like anything, right? Like, and where it's like, oh boy, I'm hearing this from, I, I guess, is it like, is it, you don't want to wait till every member credit union is like telling you that this is horrible. But like, how do you differentiate between the, the squeaky wheel and the, ooh, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, the loud voice in the room, or is it, it you yeah. know, is it really something to solve for? You know, what's great is obviously the cheap answer consensus, right? I ask other credit unions and they're like, oh, well, yeah, actually, that would be great. Generally, too, if someone's going to enter something to, into the conversation, board context or outside of it through, you know, just our engagement with our credit unions, if they get back up, like if other credit unions lean in and they're like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, now we're really onto something. Now we go look at the data. Then we go look at who needs it, who would benefit. I'm thinking of both product process on our side yeah, as well so. as legislation. But you know the interesting thing about that, and maybe I'll turn the question back to you on good advice you've heard. When I took on the challenge of the new role, one of the things people, I'd say, oh, I have a board of 18. And you know, oh my gosh, yeah. and, you know, the jokes and wow. And, and for me, the other day I was looking at the list and I couldn't think of one person that hasn't on on our current board, and I'm not just saying this because they're you made the point they are my bosses. We right. need that because we're 300 credit unions. Each of their voice yeah. contributes something, and so I, I do think they don't always need the same things. But when they're supportive of somebody else asking, even when it's not of benefit to them, sometimes that, that's when I know okay, we're really on to something because the credit unions agree on this, and it doesn't even benefit them. That's when I know to really start digging into a topic or a, a piece of policy. You're skipping me all kinds of places I want to go here. So I, I think back again, and like as more and more friends, I think a lot of this has to do with age and like met some amazing people in this space. But like as they were getting their first CEO or president roles, and they were the ones who were directly reporting and responsible, you know, like responsible to the board, I can think of many friends who, you know, they had the senior leadership position before and didn't realize like almost how much the CEO shielded them from what dealing with the board was actually like. Right. Like the, the individual relationships and, and that, like what happens if, if somebody's out there listening today, would you say have a board of 17? So 18, yeah. Yeah. 18 right. <laughs> if, if somebody is maybe they're a, a first time in that leadership position, if they're maybe they're applying for jobs for that right now. Right. Like they want to be that president CEO level. What advice would you have for them on you know, maintaining a good relationship with a board of directors, because I, I do think it's such a fascinating position to be in. Generally speaking, you were a senior leader before you became, you know, the president of the organization. So you had one boss. Now you have 18. So any advice for the new CEO or the, the soon to be? Oh, well, let's temper this with it hasn't been long around the track. And please do interview one of my board members here soon. So I would say <laughs> that from where I sit, at least my approach and uh, look, there are some good, great CEOs in the movement who were kind enough yeah. to give me advice on this. So I'm just really sharing what I put into practice from them. And that is realize I have a shared vision with the board. I have a shared purpose. And yes, they are my boss. But just like any other boss I've ever had, we're working towards the same end. Um, it doesn't need to be adversarial in that, you know, they, they have a big responsibility on their shoulders. And there's a lot of trust inherent in that relationship. But if you, you know, think of yourself as kind of like facing the board and them facing you, that'll align the thinking, I think, naturally to, with too much tension. If you align it with everybody looking at the same direction and realize, you know, you're kind of, if you think of it like the flying V, right? They're the flying V, which protects you right there in the middle. 
they're going to take on the wind shear for you. But you have, you, that means you have to work hard. That you, means you have to, you know, uh, so I, I don't know if you know this, I am not a bird nerd, but the bird in the back is actually the leader. So there's a bird in the back who's typically resting. Once they point the direction, they fall back. They It's, it's like biking, right? You, your yeah. top cyclist is not the one in the front. You know, they're in the draft of everybody else. And then you let them get the sprint. That's the kind of relationship you want with the board where they really are, you know, moving us all forward. We're sharing the goal. And then as their executive, they empower you to go get that work done, go get the win, go deliver it back to the movement, to the rest of the footprint. And so I think that that partnership has been helpful, but also they're wise. They've been there, they're CEOs. That's what's unique about lead boards. They're made up of a bunch of CEOs. So they have some of the best advice on how to be a CEO in the room. Uh, (laughs) And so I've turned to many of them, especially now as we navigate, you know, uh, consolidation, as we navigate tough policy Mm -hmm. environments, What's their advice in bringing big topics or big change to the boardroom? And then they're then they're supportive, or they're the ones who help bring that conversation up with their peers, and allowing the board to lead and not being afraid of their leadership. Shout out to my board chair Rick Skaggs. That's how he manages his board. So I've st- I've taken some policy notes from him on what that process looks like, so that we can replicate it and empower our board members instead of try to manage our board members. Uh, I like that. That's good stuff there. There's, there's all, all kinds of nuggets in that one. I, I wanted to ask you this because, I mean, you mentioned four different states, right? I mean, you're in Virginia's coming in now. I feel like over the last few years, like we've, we've kind of all realized that work, and I'm doing air quotes again, isn't a physical place necessarily. <laughs> and many credit unions, we know, are very skeptical about the idea of remote work and things like that. And, and there's all kinds of different hybrids and everything that's going on today. But Like when you look forward, what do you, I guess, envision, you know, a a career in credit unions looking like down the road if we want to attract the, you know, the the best and most motivated talent? Yeah, this will come as a surprise to no one. I am a big proponent of remote work. I was remote before the pandemic. You should be out with the credit unions. You should be out in the community. That's a natural part of the work. And I had come from, you know, the, the law firm I was at previously, it was a, you know, multinational law firm. They had offices everywhere. And so it was, it was not outside the realm of thinking to be working with teams that were very dispersed. And I do think credit unions, because of our origin story, all starting in the same facilities or the same, right. you know, uh, school district, we started local. So that idea has taken us a lot longer. And I know the pandemic didn't hit every market the same. And so some never dispersed. But I will say this about you make such a great point. It's about what's next, not how we got here, not even what's working today. If you want to attract top talent, you're going to have to have flexibility. More than that, your members are dispersed. Your members aren't just... Absolutely. (laughs) So I'm running a one woman experiment. Uh, I'm a, still a member proudly of one of my Oregon credit unions. And I have nice. not been in a credit union branch for more than a, cre- like I go for credit union visits and presentations. I have not done business in a credit union branch in just about three years. And that means selling houses, buying houses, credit cards, the whole thing. And so I, I push a lot on the mentality in credit union space of we need these brick billboards or we need branching. And a branching a branch can be a strategy and service has to be, phenomenal. But how we get to that with our teams, I, I like the credit unions who are really trying to think outside the box there and, and push themselves to look at the future of the workforce. They're gonna there are some really good pioneers out there on it. Jill, Jill and I bought a house earlier this year with our credit union that's in a different state that neither one of us has ever lived in. So <laughs> we've never, we, yeah, so I hear you completely. We've never seen a branch of the, our joint credit union. So <laughs> one more question here before I start to move on towards the end of the show. But, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a leader in, a, in the cooperative financial movement that gives you you have influence. What does influence or even I, two, completely two separate words? And I know this, but so you can choose to go anyway, but influence or empowerment mean to you in your position, both kind of internally and and like what you're able to to do externally? Very good question. The first thing that comes to mind is just there's a power in people thinking, oh, I could do that too. And the league president space has obviously consolidated, but there's a lot of fresh faces to the the air quotes here as well. LP room, right? The league president room. And I I love seeing that. I think That's been wonderful, not because there was a problem, but because many of us were mentored by the previous generation 
and we're invested in what 30 years from now looks like in the movement. I want to hear a lot more conversations. I once said this, golly, talk about sometimes speaking up in a space that you don't understand, but doing it anyway. I show up to the large credit union roundtable and, you know, it's all these really, really <laughs> sophisticated, phenomenal credit union leaders. And I just couldn't help myself. I kept getting frustrated though, because everyone was talking about six months from now and two years and the market and the end. And at the end of the day, finally, I just kind of, a little bit on brand for me, but put my hand in the air and was just like, hey, I didn't hear a single person in here talk about the next five years or the next 10 years. And that worries mm-hmm. me because yes, I'm the youngest league president in the nation, the youngest female league president in the nation. Sure, sure. But that's not why I'm asking. I'm asking because I'm the generation of consumer that you all should be thinking about. And I've got Absolutely. 30 more years of my, hopefully more than that, I hopefully have 50 more years of my financial life cycle. And right. I want to make sure that you guys are thinking that. And it's because most people arrive in these positions towards a sense, a natural sunset in their, their tenure and their career and their time. But that aligns sometimes with thinking as well. And so I, yeah. I do push on that a bit. I want, I want CEOs saying, I want to dream for 15 years from now, even though I won't be here. That's I, what that legacy is brilliant. means. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more on that. I don't have time to go more down that, but I would love to. (laughs) So one last question before we move into having a little fun with the rapid fire questions. Was there anything that you hoped I was going to ask you today that I didn't that you'd like to talk about? (laughs) Well, yeah, I hoped you were going to ask me my favorite superhero since that's my favorite interview question. No, oh, well, that's we're, we're moving to the rapid fire, so that can that can be in there because I've that already added happen. another Great. one. That's yeah, that that really can. So with that, let's let's move on to the to the rapid fire questions. Your uh, the questions are rapid, but your answers don't have to be. So, what's your favorite superhero? <laughs> Wonder Woman, of course, and it's that's mostly fantastic. for the costume. So uh, now the one that I added, you said you know missionary work in like thirty different countries. Which which what's your favorite country you've been to? The Philippines. Oh, that's you know, Jill and I were on our way to the Philippines when COVID hit. We turned around oh, from really? LA and got back home. Yep, we were on our way there to go diving in the Philippines, and we haven't not rescheduled that trip yet. But yep, so we have. I have not been there. I've spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia, but not the Philippines. So amazing. yeah, well, sign me up. I'll, I'll crash your. <laughs> I'll crash your fun trip. But the, we actually spent a little time connecting with the Filipino credit union movement, and uh-huh. I was very excited and working towards a trip. But you know, the life has happened since. But I do hope to bring something together where our credit unions can go learn it. And the culture is amazing. When you put that together, you'll have to let us tag along with that too. So (laughs) Uh, what was the the first job you ever had? (laughs) Where you ever made a buck? What was the first job? My very first, oh, lifeguarding. And I was dismal. I I know a lot of people enjoyed, you know, that high school lifeguarding job. It stressed me out. I just took it way too seriously. So (laughs) a little, yeah, the, the, the gravity of it, uh, of what could happen. (laughs) Is is there anything that's taken up the personal space for you currently? What are you working on, Samantha? (laughs) Like on that, not in the job role, just on the side, I I guess, whatever you'd like to say. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. You have personal (laughs) space. It would be, you know, if I'm not constantly working on credit union league land, it's my three tiny humans. Mm -hmm. I have three girls and just enjoy them. We have a farm out in the middle of nowhere, Alabama. So there is a little bit of time we got to spend on the land and with the chickens. But if I'm not on a zoom or in a, at a credit union visit, I'm hanging out with those amazing people. <laughs> with those three little ones. Uh, mm-hmm. Very cool. Okay, th- this ties right into that. Often, and I, I firsthand know the LP job just from being around Jill when she was up in Connecticut with that. Uh, it, and it can take up a lot of time in space, right? Like you're being pulled in a lot of different directions. What have you learned over time to kind of create that? I always hate to use the word balance, but you know, to still make sure you're making enough time for those three tiny wish- little humans and stuff like that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I've learned balance. I will say harmony. The biggest thing I've learned is to remember what job one is and that that's my family. And then yeah. everything else comes second. But look, my team would tell you in, a, in full candor, I don't do it well. I am working on it. And some seasons I just have to relent and say, look, this is the season I'm in. The next one will look yeah. different. And it might you know, by spring next year, I might have a little bit of a winter, which is time just to, you know, put my head down and, and do a little self-study and get better. It's in high spring and summer, it's go time, which honestly, I thrive on go time. I don't know what I do in winter. (laughs) Amazing. Okay. You've talked about regulation and uh, the the compliance side of things. This is my Chairman Harper question. Who who plays you in the movie, the biopic of your life? 
Oh, gosh. Golly. Uh, I would hope uh, Jennifer Lawrence, she'd actually be funny where I was not funny. She would have killed the stand-up thing, right? Uh, and <laughs> she's just as fun with the roles as she does. So. Any, you mentioned one book earlier. Any other uh, books that either you're reading or you, you think everybody should check out? I love an audiobook. So much time on the road with credit unions. I spend a lot of time yeah. listening to audiobooks. Yeah. I'm listening to one right now called The Wager. It's a little dry. It's about a, a very, very infamous boat crash, though. Uh, and once you get into it, you realize why, because the players and, you know, British history and kind of the maritime law that it spawned. And it, it's a reminder as a leader that uh, there can be two sides to every story. You can lead horribly while some people think you're leading really well. I, I might be over dissecting it, but it's also about 30 hours, which is wonderful because then I don't have to look for a new audio. You don't have to do one. Yeah. A good amount of time. You got time. When you hear the word success, who is the first person that comes to mind and why? My dad. It, because he has always believed in my success. He's, if I need a cheerleader, if I need to pick me up, if I need professional advice, uh, he's on speed dial. That's awesome. I love it. Dad's getting a shout out. Last question. Do you have any uh, final thoughts you'd like to share with our listeners or, or an ask of them? Yeah, I do. Shamelessly, because you said, ah, I can't help myself given the gravity of what some of our credit union families going through right now. You know, if, if folks listening, I imagine this is still going to be a few weeks from now. The need is still going to be there. Our credit unions uh, could really use some support rebuilding from both Helene and unfortunately what looks like the impacts of Milton are going to be. So if anyone feels motivated, a dollar makes a difference. We're helping people refill refrigerators and pay hotel bills for the weeks that they're going to be displaced and um, for their lost income. And it all goes to credit union system employees and so if they feel inclined, they can give through the Southeastern Credit Union Foundation website. Well, we will link to that for sure in the show notes and everything else. Samantha, thank you so much for being on the show today, my friend. I enjoyed this so much, and we're going to have to do this again. A few things before we go. Please make sure to check out our sponsor, Valera, in the show notes. Valera is the nation's premier payments credit union service organization in financial technology solutions provider. They're also a longtime supporter of the show and allowing me to have this much fun doing what I do. So please stop by and check them out. Please also subscribe to the CU Insight Experience on your favorite podcast player. We're on them all. And if you're looking for a book mentioned on the show, a quick Google of the CU Insight Experience podcast book list in your next read is on its way from Amazon. Last but certainly not least, I want to thank all of you for listening. Y'all rock. And I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Be well, friends.